well we are going to discuss about sonnet number 18 by William Shakespeare well William Shakespeare the very name has become almost synonymous with English literature he is the flag bearer of English literature like if we think about Bengali literature the first name that comes to our mind is Rabindranath Tagore of course and similarly the name that comes to our mind when you think about English literature is none other than William Shakespeare he himself contributed at least 20,000 words to the English vocabulary which surpasses the credits by even the epic poet John Milton and Homer. Milton has hardly contributed 9,000 or something and Homer has contributed uh, something more than 8,000 and this very man he has contributed 20,000 words on his own so you can guess how much influential he is in the history of English literature now before uh, going into the poem let us discuss in a brief about William Shakespeare well I will not discuss about his biography you can uh, read it well from your book but I will refer to some points that will be helpful in discussing the poem itself. William Shakespeare, he has written 37 plays in total and his fame mainly rests on these plays, these dramas, which include tragedies, comedies and some historical plays. And some notable works include, as you have read earlier in class 11, Macbeth, Hamlet, King Lear, Antonio Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, Othello, among the comedies Midsummer Night's Dream, As You Like It, Twelfth Night, Tempest, and some historical plays. But besides all these, though I, as I have mentioned that his fame mainly rests on these plays, he has written also two long poems, Venus and Adonis, Rape of Lucrece. What is most important and contextual here is that Shakespeare has also tried his hand in writing sonnets. He has written 154 sonnets, which are remarkable for more than one reason. Well, before discussing these 154 sonnets, let me tell you or let me discuss in a nutshell what sonnet actually is. Now, sonnet is a very popular kind of lyrical poem which consists of 14 lines and essentially it's, it has a rhyme scheme. The word sonnet comes from Italian word sonetto that means a song as I have told you sonnet is a lyrical poem but what the term lyrical poem suggest the word lyrical comes from lyre it's a musical instrument used in ancient Greece so sonnet is such a poem that can be sung with but in accompaniment with a lyre it's a very short poem as you have uh, noticed that uh, it consists of only 14 lines in ancient Rome this sonnet writing developed in the hands of Dante and Cavalcanti but sonnet became popular by Petrarch. The sonnets written by Petrarch was mainly a love poem in which the male lover used to praise 
his lady love the beauty of his adorable love the divine beauty i must say rather the divine beauty of his lady love and he used to express his feelings the feelings of his heart in the poem so sonnet was usually a love poem and when we discuss about its form we have already said that sonnet is a poem consisting of 14 lines and this 14 lines were divided into two parts the first eight lines were called octave and the last six lines were called the sestet in between the gap exists which is called volta this volta indicates a shift in thought a change in thought so the 14 lines that were divided into octave and sestet in between there was a volta now during the period of renaissance the english poets like thomas wyatt or of surrey they tried to imitate writing sonnets and in their hand sonnet actually developed evolved and changed but when in the elizabethan period the eminent playwright shakespeare tried his hands in writing sonnet it changed not only in theme but also in its structure in its form now we are getting back to that point when i referred that shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets among the sonnets sonnet number 1 to sonnet number 126 these were dedicated to mr w h and this w h is referred to by the critics as earl of southampton who was the patron of shakespeare but some other critics they try to argue in this point they differ in this respect the next sonnet number 127 to 152 they are addressed to a dark lady so notice the difference there is between petrarchan sonnet and the shakespearean sonnet the first 126 sonnets they are dedicated to a handsome youth the next 127 to 152 sonnets they are dedicated to a dark lady he has neither divine beauty nor he has she has something very adorable and the last 152 and 153 and 154 sonnet they are dedicated to cupid who is the roman god of love so here we come to the 154 sonnets in our syllabus we are going to read sonnet number 18 now from sonnet number 1 to sonnet number 17 shakespeare arges his friend his handsome young friend to marry so that he may live through his procreation he may live through his children his beauty may be eternalized through his offsprings through his procreation but in sonnet number 18 he has changed his thought here we will see that shakespeare wishes to immortalize his friend's beauty through the line of his verse through the line of his poem and he is very much confident that his friend's beauty will be preserved in the lines of his poems 
there is a conflict we find in the poem there is a conflict between time and youth or beauty youth or beauty cannot escape the onslaught of time youth and beauty are subject to the ravages of time time destroys decays every beautiful object in nature and shakespeare's friend he cannot escape the onslaught of the omnipotent time this theme we can find in the writings of horace and ovid but the treatment that shakespeare provides here is completely different shakespeare wishes and desires to preserve the beauty of his friend in the line of his poem again as there is a change in the theme of the sonnet there is also a change in the form of the sonnet written by shakespeare in the petrarchan sonnet we have discussed that the sonnet was divided into two parts the first eight lines were called octave last six lines were called sestet but in shakespearean sonnet he has divided the 40 lines into three quatrains q u a t r a i n s three quatrains the quatrains are cons consisted of four lines each proti ta quatrain charte kore line ni gothito so we get 12 lines the last two lines are called couplet two lines are called couplets so shakespearean sonnets they are consisted of three quatrains and a couplet in place of the petrarchan sonnet which was divided into two parts octave and sestet so i think i can clarify the features of sonnet here how the shakespearean sonnet is different from the traditional sonnets i mean the petrarchan sonnets as were well practiced by the english precursors writers like as i have named thomas wait all of sare philip sidney edmund spencer but shakespeare made a deviation similarly there is a change in the rhyme scheme there is a change in the rhyme scheme the three quatrains used to rhyme like a b a b c d c d e f e f and the couplet used to rhyme like g g a b a b c d c d e f e f g g this is the rhyme scheme that we are going to find in the poem that we are going to read right now now we have already discussed about sonnet about william shakespeare if you have any confusion if you have any questions you can freely write it down in the comment box well now i have uh, completed my introductory discussion let's move into reading the poem and analyzing it i'm going to read out the poem for you shall i compare thee to a summer's day thou art more lovely and more temperate rough winds to set the darling buds of me and summer's leaves hath all to sort it it so here you see day rhymes with may and temperate rhymes with date so the rhyme scheme as i have told you earlier is a b a b now come to the first line the very beginning sentence shall i compare thee with a summer's day the poem begins with an interrogation there is a question as the at the very beginning of the poem actually in literature such questions are called rhetorical questions 
rhetorical questions are those that have the answer inherent in it uttor ta eri moddhe nihito ache ei dhoroner proshno ke amra boli rhetorical question shall i compare thee to a summer's day shall i compare compare i am going to compare you with i am going to compare the poet is going to compare his friend's beauty with that of the summer the the is an archaic word archaic means the word that has become obsolete that has become that has no more of any use now but the poets has the liberty to use such archaic words for creating such poetic effects kobider ekmatro anumoti ache ei dhoroner archaic word byabohar korar kintu archaic word ekhon ar byabohar hoy na they have become obsolete they are of no use right now so shall i compare the the means you ami ki tomake tulona korbo to a summer's day ekta grishsher diner sathe so here you might become confused that why the poet is going to compare his friend's beauty with a summer's day how summer can be so beautiful well my friend don't forget that in the european countries like england summer is beautiful lovely comfortable moderate and it is praised for its its warmth summer is a beautiful season there so the poet wants to but wishes to compare his friend's beauty sorry for the interruption well uh, let's get back to the line shall i compare thee to a summer's day the poet asks here will it be very appropriate comparison to compare his friend's beauty with a summer's day the general question or the answer to the question is no i shall not ami kokhonoi korbo na so it is a rhetorical question that has the answer inherent in it i will never compare you with a summer's day so in the very beginning of the poem the poet rejects the idea that comparison of his friend's beauty with summer will be inappropriate it will not be a suitable comparison eta ta uporjukto tulona hote pare na tar karon ta ki thou art more lovely and more temperate thou it's also an archaic word it means you art means are it's also an archaic word thou art more lovely more temperate you are more beautiful lovely means beautiful more temperate temperate means moderate you are more gentle you are more mild your beauty is more mild than the summer's day your beauty is more moderate than the summer's day it's more soothing rough winds do sick the darling birds of may rough winds of may the rough winds of summer the powerful winds of the gust of the wind in summer sick the darling birds of may it destroys the rough winds destroys the darling birds of may darling means lovely very favorable birds birds were destined to bloom into flower and make the nature beautiful but summer has that gust of wind that destroys the birds so summer will be inappropriate and summer's lease has all to sort a date summer's lease lease is a legal term lease means here a contract a legal agreement chukti summer's lease the agreement made with summer hath all to sort a date the time span given to summer is very short summer has very short duration so it will not be very appropriate to compare his friend's beauty with that of a summer's day therefore he rejects the very idea to compare his friend's beauty with a day in summer so we have completed reading the first question moving towards the second question 
sometime too hot the eye of heaven signs sometimes too hot the eye of heaven eye of heaven is a metaphor at a rupok it refers to eye of heaven akasher chok that is refers to the sun the eye of heaven refers to sun sometimes too hot the eye of heaven signs kokhono kokhono surjo ta too hot it's enough hot it's so hot that we cannot tolerate it cannot bear it shojjo korte bhai na amra so sometimes the days in summer becomes unbearable because of its warmth because of its temperature and often is his gold complexion dimmed often is his gold complexion the complexion of sun is compared with gold the color of gold gold complexion dimmed dimmed means it becomes fade sometimes it shines too hot sometimes it becomes faded it becomes dimmed it becomes clouded it becomes sheltered and every fear for fear sometimes declines this is a very important lines i will suggest you to underline the line and every fear from fear sometimes declines every fear from fear there is there are two fear in the same sentence the first fear means every beautiful object and the second fear means beauty of that object the first fear means every beautiful object and the second fear means the beauty of that very object prothom fear bojhacche ekta sundor jinish ar ditiyo fear bojhacche tar soundorjo every fear from fear sometimes declines prottekti sundor bostui tar soundorjo theke skholito hoy potito hoy so the beauty of a beautiful object is subject to decay it subject to be destroyed every beautiful object loses its beauty prottekti sundor jinishi tar soundorjo hariye fele by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed by chance chance means misfortune by accident by some um, misfortune or nature's changing course untrimmed nature's changing course nature is subject to change it cannot remain the same all the time nature changes so everything in it changes and everything in nature is subject to destruction prottekti jinish kintu aste aste shesh hoy nothing is eternal nothing is immortal nothing is ephemeral everything is temporary so everything is subject to decay by misfortune or natural course of time untrimmed untrimmed means unadorned it gets shorn of its beauty it gets shorn of tar soundorjo theke ta kintu potito hoy the third question but die eternal summer shall not fade die die means your d means you die means your die eternal summer eternal summer summer he refers to here the beauty of the of his friend die eternal summer shall not fade your eternal beauty will never fade here the poet has come to prove his point kobi ekhane nijeke pramanito korchen ebong he wants to assert something he wants to express his robust determination tar dirho monobhav tini poshon korte chaichen but die eternal summer shall not fade your eternal beauty your immortal beauty will not be faded it will not be diminished anyhow nor lose possession of that fear the west nor lose possession of that fear fear means beauty the beauty that you possess will not be lost je soundorjo tumi dharon kore acho ta tumi harabe na nor lose possession of that fear the west west means that you own the beauty that you own will never be lost je soundorjo tumi odhikar kore acho ta tumi kokhonoi harabe na 
nor shall death break the wonder sting is said underline call nor shall death break thou here death has been personified mrittu tak ekjon byaktir sathe tulona kora hoyeche it has been personified it has been invested with human qualities so it has been personified nor shall death break the wonder sting is said death will never announce itself proud announce proud death will never feel himself proud মৃত্যু কখনো নিজেকে এত গর্বিত অনুভব করবে না দাউ ওয়ান্ডারেস্ট ইন হিজ সেড দাউ ইউ ওয়ান্ডারেস্ট ইউ আর রোমিং ইউ আর মুভিং ইন হিজ সেড আন্ডার ইটস অ্যাবোর্ড দ্য অ্যাবোর্ড অফ ডেথ দ্য ডেথ উইল নেভার ফিল প্রাউড দ্যাট ইউর বিউটি ইউ আর রোমিং ইন হিজ অ্যাবোর্ড দ্য ওয়ার্ল্ড অফ ডেথ দ্যাট মিন্স ইউ উইল নেভার ডাই the poet asserts that his friend is never going to die he will never go to the kingdom of death when in eternal lines to time thou growest when in eternal lines to time eternal lines refers to this very poem and the poet is very much optimistic that this poem the poet is very much optimistic that this poem will be eternal and the line will be immortal and so he asserts that he expresses his strong determination that when in eternal lines to time thou growest when he will grow in this eternal lines of my poem so in the third quatrain the poet expresses his plan his wish his desire how he is going to preserve the beauty of his friend in his poem the last couplet so long as men can breathe and eyes can see this is a robust assertion khub ekta dirho tar chinta tar ekta dirho monobhav tini prakash korchen dirho bishwas it's a strong belief tar dik theke ekta khub dirho bishwas eta ki so long as men can live joto din manush beche thakbe and or eyes can see or he can see through his eyes so long there will be the existence of man in this world and he can see through his eye so long lives this so long lives this so long this poem will live and gives life to thee and this poem will give life to you that means his friend after finishing the poem you can well realize that the poet is very much true the poet died in 1660 but even in the 21st century when we are reading the poem we can well realize how beautiful how handsome his friend was so isn't the poet very much true isn't he very much uh, strong in his belief that his poem will be eternal one day and whoever will read his poem will know about the beauty of his friend and in this way his friend will be immortal ei bhabei tar bondhu amorotto labh korbe